Awesome. So, uh, hello everyone. I'm David Scribonia. Um, I work at a company called Segment. I do security there. Um, a member of the Zap Core team. And uh, pretty excited to be speaking today, even this early. This is my first time speaking at a conference. So, yeah. <laughs> if I start uh, speaking too fast or mumbling, someone just wave at me. Um, and I'm here today to talk about the heads up display. Um, which is kind of cool that to be talking at this conference because I didn't even realize the theme for this conference was like enabling through security. Um, that's really what this whole project is about: is how can we enable people um, with Zap? Uh, so a little bit about myself: I mentioned I work at Segment. Um, before that, I had various internships at a couple different places. Graduated from Cal Poly. Um, in the past, I've worked on the App Center project, and uh, now I'm working on uh, Zap. So for anyone who's unfamiliar with Zap, uh, the Z attack proxy, um, this is a tool to help you uh, pen test your web app. Uh, so it's a Java application, open source. Um, and the way it works is uh, you're going to fire up Zap, and it's going to act as a proxy. So you can go visit the site you're trying to test. In this case, we have Juice Shop. And as you send your requests, it's going to intercept them. And can, when the response comes back from the server, it'll intercept that. And along the way, it can do a bunch of powerful things uh, having that position. And so typically, when you're running Zap, it looks something like this. You'll have your uh, Zap window open on one side. You'll have your browser open on one side. And you'll play in the browser, and then go back to the, to the Java window, play in there, and then come back. And here's a list of just some of the things that Zap can do. Um, basic stuff like intercepting and replaying requests. Basics, uh, fuzzing though, passive scanning, active scanning. It's got a full-fledged suite of add-ons um, and you can do scripting from it. It's got an API. It's just a, a really, really powerful tool um, for anyone in application security. But Zap isn't necessarily trivial to start using. Um, tons of features, a lot of them are, uh, have really cool configurations hidden in context menus of context menus, right? So it's kind of hard to find these things. Um, I mean, even a lot of security people will go through training just to use this properly. So we were asking ourselves on the team, what can we do to make this tool to help better enable developers? Um, what are the things we can look at to improve this? Because I think if you were to ask um, working at a big team, if you were to ask your developer, oh, hey, so you're building this new feature, and you ask them, is this vulnerable to XSS? Like, it's not really a trivial thing to figure out. I think a lot of time, they won't know. But even so, they might say, well, how do I even test that? Like, what do you want me to do? And all of a sudden, it's going to fall back to security, right? Now the security team is testing this. Like, wouldn't it be great if we keep pushing that the other way? If we keep pushing these um, sort of tasks and tests towards the developers, it would be awesome to give them the power to do this. And just like a lot of people have mentioning, um, enabling security can help your, uh, help enabling your developers improves the security of your whole org. I mean, specifically in this case, I'm talking about enabling your developers with usable security tooling. That's just like one small part of all the things you can do to enable them. So if we can create more usable security tools, like why not provide those for our developers to use? We can improve the security of our whole organization that way. And so there's three things we looked at that we wanted to address um, to change Zap to help with this. We wanted to make it more accessible, intuitive, and flexible. So accessible, I want it to be easy to start using. You can put it in front of someone and they'll immediately be able to dive into it. It should be intuitive and they should be in a more native environment. I'll talk about what I mean about that. And flexible, it should be able to fit their needs. Every developer is gonna have different needs and you should be able to create an application that they can adjust. So we decided to take some inspiration from heads-up displays. So this is a heads-up display for a fighter pilot. And you can notice just how much information is being displayed so efficiently here. And we've got things like speed, altitude. We have something called the bore sight, which is where your nose is pointing. You have something called the flight path vector, which is the direction the plane is actually moving in. You have acceleration, the angle of attack, which is the wing angle relative to the airflow. Um, you have an attack reticle, I and mean, you've got a compass. You have all this information so readily available. And imagine 
trying to fly this plane if instead of this information displayed here was on a bunch of gauges and knobs? If you're in a dogfight, you can't keep looking around to try to find that. It's going to be impossible to operate. So here's another heads-up display in video games. And again, we have a mini-map on here, objective markers, information about your teams, dynamic displays over their head, um, information about your health and your ammo. And again, imagine if you had to pause the game and go to a separate menu every time you wanted to view this. You killed immediately. Like, there's no way you can play this game doing that without a heads-up display. And these are the exact same issues, I think, that plague Zap. It's like when you're flying your plane, that's like when you're in the browser doing your testing. And now you have to go to a separate context. Like, why not put those things together? It's going to make it so much more intuitive. So that brings us to the Zap heads-up display. And um, oh, time to wake up. <laughs> uh, cool. Let's go to a demo. So I've got these videos here for backup. Um, but all right, you guys are gonna have to bear with me for a sec while I can only change the resolution on my screen and not that one. So now my screen is microscopic. We'll see, I'll just drag it over. Cool, so here we have Zap and cool. So here we have Zap running on the right side and we have Google running on the left side and you can see that we have the heads up display uh, overlaid on top of it. So what we've done is we've um, taken a bunch of the different features of Zap and put them into uh, these tools. So you can see that we have, um, bring my cursor over here. you see we have a tool for the scope. So if I were to add Google to our scope, which allows us to define what sort of sites we want to attack, you can actually see over in here, under the Google side, that it's now actually been changed in Zap as well. We have a tool over here for the site tree. And so you can see all the different sites you visited, and you can dive into different things. And all these things are the same powers that are in Zap reflected here. But we don't even really need to see Zap when we're using it. So, let's see, actually let's see if I can select these displays real quick. Uh, here, there we go. Nice, way easier. <laughs> cool. Um, so if we were to go to, let's go to Juice Shop. And let's look through some of the tools we have here. You can see that as we went to Juice Shop, uh, our HUD updated itself to say that we know the Juice Shop's not in scope. Um, and you see on the right side, we have these different alert tools. And so these are our um, site alerts. So these are gonna be uh, um, alerts that Zap has found across the entire domain. And on the left side, we have the one specific for this page. And so if we were to click on one of these, we can see all the lists of alerts um, that have been detected here. And we can even zoom in then and learn more information about that specific alert. And because we want this to be um, customizable, let's say I don't really care about these low page alerts. Well, I can just remove it from my heads up display uh, and we can customize it however we want. So let's see, another, let's go to, let's go to some cool features to show. Um, we also have the history tab down here, and so this is going to be just like your developer tools. Um, it's got your network history down here, and we can even add more tools along the side to show more information. But of course we can inspect this. If we wanted to, we could replay it right here, or we could replay it in the browser. So let's try intercepting a message. So we hide this, and we turn break on. 
So now we're uh, actively intercepting all messages. And let's see, let me turn that off real quick and go here. Uh, let's see, let's turn it on. And so you see, as soon as we click that, this modal popped up right away, so we've intercepted the message. We no longer need to switch back to Zap and back here. It's all happening right here at one time. And so we have the option to step or continue. And so we can step through this one. That'll let that one through. We've got the response. We can step through that one. And if we do this one more time, we should see, oh, here we go. Um, Oh, I forgot to log into this. But we can um, intercept messages and then we can modify them and send them through and you can see those changes. We can continue to stop intercepting all of them. And another new feature, let's go to, let's go to the OWASP site. So we have this tool. Um, we can add more tools to our panels on either side just by hearing here. And you can see this, uh, all these different lists of tools we have available to us. So we can add this show enable hidden fields tool. And you notice that it's updated with a six. That's telling us there are six hidden fields along the site. And if we turn them on, you can see we've now changed it and modified it to show the hidden fields on this page. And that's like kind of a silly feature because you could just look in the source and see how that works. But people's brains just start turning here thinking about all the cool things we can now do. And of course, we can just turn that off and it goes away. And so one of the cool things we can do Got another test site running. We have this uh, feature called attack mode. So if anyone's used that before, when you turn on attack mode, it's just gonna throw the house at whatever you're visiting. It's gonna throw all these different fuzzing payloads. Um, it's gonna start spidering, it's gonna do everything. So if we turn that on, we should see over here, uh, Let's see, let me visit, as we go, send a request. Oh, we gotta add it to scope first. And if we turn on attack mode, you can search thing on the right, that Zap's just hammering it already. It's sending a bunch of requests. And if we search for something, we should start to see that as it's attacking it, it's gonna start detecting issues. And we might see a couple of pop-ups down here when it finds them. Let's see, let me try spidering this first. So if we run the spider, you can see that it's showing the percentages over there as it's hammering the entire site. And so we can run the spider directly from the HUD. And you can see that as it's spidering, the passive scanner is running and automatically detecting issues and notifying you as they come up. And we can turn that off. And if we turn attack mode back on, you can see these, these modals, if we click on them, again, we can see the information right there about what the issue was. And there it is. We just found SQL injection on this page. So if we go back to this search feature, we turn off attack mode. Let's see if it works. Uh, no, I turned the attack mode off. And there's a bunch of background threads running this thing as it's like filling up or finishing the queue. Um, so yeah, I can show the video later. Right now it's not working. But what we have is that when we detect issues with identifiable elements on the page, we can take these uh, page alert icons and we actually put them right in the page. And so like I was showing you with the showing hidden fields, we'll actually have a little red flag right by our form field. And when you click on it, it'll tell you the information. It's saying there's a vulnerability right here. And you can imagine the cool things we can do after that. So one of the motivations that drew me to this project was I kept thinking, like how cool would it be if we had hacker goggles, right? Like what if you could see the browser through the way that security professionals do, right? Because when you visit a page, you don't see it like a normal person. You see forms and you know you get excited, right? You see cookies flying around, you see some headers, and you're like, okay, I should probably play with these. And like what if we could take that same, we could take that knowledge base and put it in something that simply overlays over it. And so one of the tools we're gonna be building is that next to the forms, you can have a little icon with the crosshair and when you click on it, it's gonna show you a list of fuzzing payloads. So you can click one and it's just gonna start hammering it and a side panel will show you the result of that fuzzing. Cool. So let's see, I wanna show one more thing off with this. So we have all these cool tools, but the goal isn't for the Zap team 
to build all the tools. We're the only team that can build them. He just want everyone to build them, right? Um, that was resolutions gnarly. So one way to do that is we've actually, I'm gonna show you how to create a new tool, hopefully, in less than a few minutes. And so there's this scripting feature of Zap. And what it allows you to do is you can kind of get these hooks into various parts of Zap and you can run your own code at that. And so we've written this script right here and all of this script does, um, it's a Zest script, which is kind of a graphical language, so you can kind of decide what you wanna do with it. And all this is doing is gonna say, um, if we see a certain value, we're gonna change it to another one. In this case, I've made this script, uh, script say, if you see the word budget, just replace it with hack it. But again, you can put whatever you want here and in whatever language you want. So, we also have in the scripting language, or in the scripting uh, add-on, uh, um, all, these are all the files that make up the HUD. And so we can take one of these tools right here. So we can take um, the, let's take the attack tool. And if we duplicate it, and we'll call it uh, hack it. Save that. So we can see in this panel over here, uh, this is the code that's uh, running in the HUD. So we only need to change a few things to actually create a new tool. So let's change the name. Let's change this label. Let's change, we can leave that all the same. And we can say, uh, and we can say, hack it. And there's only a few things we actually need to change here. That's gonna be that when we start running it, we wanna change uh, the, the Zap API call. Because we can use these Zap API calls to trigger these scripts we've set up. And I think, let's see, I don't have my notes for this one. I believe it's just gonna be, uh, well, while I actually look this up, I can show you um, all, all of the, the Zap API that powers this. It's pretty cool if you haven't looked at it. Um, it's super extensive. You can pa run basically the entire application from the API. Um, if you go to the core, I mean, this is just some of the endpoints that are available to you. And you can really automate this whole thing. And so if we go to script, enable, nice. It's pretty easy. So it should just be, uh, Scripts, enable, and script name. I usually have these things more ready, but my Wi-Fi uh, card stopped working this morning, so I had like five minutes of prep before I got here. <laughs> and I think... Be good. Cool. Script. And this should be cool. Let's see if that works. Hopefully, it'll be tight. So we've now just uh, created this new tool. It's in there. And we should be able to see it if we go here. And um, I'm just going to clear out uh, the currently running um, uh, HUD. And I'll talk a little bit more about uh, how this actually works in the background. Um, and so if we restart it, it's going to restart the whole thing. And shoot. Oh, here it is. So you can see we now have this new tool here. This is the Hackett tool. And if we add it to it, you can see it on our heads-up display here. We can turn it on, and let's see. There it is. Instead of Bakhtet, it says Hackett. Awesome. <laughs> so this is, again, kind of a silly script, but like, you can put whatever you want in here. 
and I just hooked it up right to the heads-up display. So imagine all the things that your developers, all the different um, things they want to test, all the different scripts, uh, they can just hook it up to this visual interface really quickly. Awesome. So, I guess I don't want that. Uh, awesome. Great, so now I'm going to dive into how this actually all works. Because this isn't a, uh, an extension in Firefox, this isn't a Chrome extension. We're actually doing a bunch of things uh, to create this interface without going through that path. Because we didn't want to have to deal with um, the idiosyncrasies of the, having to deal with both extension frameworks and having to keep two code bases maintained. So we wanted something that we could universally inject into any browser. So I'm gonna start nerding out in this part, so. Um, so here we have uh, Zap, how it usually works. It's gonna intercept the request and send the response back. But when we use the heads-up display, we actually do, when we send the response back, we add, we inject this um, JavaScript in there that's gonna power the HUD. And so if you were to look at the source code of uh, the page that had just been injected, you'll see right after the body tag, we've put uh, this uh, script tag in there. And what that script tag is going to do is it's going to um, support a little bit of code that's going to run on your target domain, so the site you're attacking. And we have this jo uh, JavaScript in there, but we don't want to modify the thing we're trying to scan, right? We don't want to murk up our results. So we use a JavaScript closure to hide it from the rest of uh, the JavaScript running in there so they can't interact with it or mess with what you're doing. And what it's going to do is it's going to then immediately change the DOM to add a bunch of iframes. And these are going to be the visual elements you see. So we have the different panels, the bottom drawer, and because we can't have one iframe with the whole thing, because you can't click through to the page, you have to have all these separate little iframes to build up the components. And so, when you run it, you can see that the different iframes get added to it. Um, and so, uh, great, now we've got our iframes running, we've got some code on there, uh, you did it. Well, it's like we have a little bit more than that because we can't quite get all the functionality we need just from running JavaScript in these few iframes. And one of the reasons is for a scenario, this scenario right here, which is, you can see on the right, um, without the heads of display, we're intercepting a message, and you can see on the left, uh, we've got our site, right? So we fired off this request and the browser's waiting for the response. And you can see that it is, it's just sitting here waiting. And it's actually, at this point, then unloaded JavaScript. So if we had JavaScript running on this page that we wanted to display this alert with, with a heads-up display, it's already been taken out of the page. There's nothing running there for anything more for us to communicate back. And so that's where we use a service worker. And so if you're unfamiliar with service workers, it's basically just a web worker, which is like a background JavaScript thread, except it has a few more permissions, um, and it persists between page loads, which is something a web worker can't do. So now we have something that is, no matter what your, um, when your pages you're closing in and out, we can still have um, some code running. And the service worker is gonna communicate uh, with these uh, iframes via the post message API. And that's not to be confused with HTTP post messages, but this is a browser uh, API that lets you communicate cross frame and cross domain. And what we have is all of the logical function of the HUD is running in the service worker and it's gonna communicate with these frames. We wanna be as lightweight as possible so that um, as we're loading them, they're not taking too long and it's not having a terrible user experience. But post message API, to communicate to other iframes, you actually need a hook to that window. You need a reference to the window object. And the service worker is in a privileged position where it can get access to any of the iframes on its own domain. And so all these iframes are actually running in a separate domain than the target page running in the zap domain, that way we can get some isolation from the code that we're trying to attack. And so it automatically gets a hook to those, but the service worker doesn't have a hook to our injected script on the target domain, because it's not allowed to interact with that. But our iframes do have a hook to the parent page because they were loaded from there. And so we can go from the iframe then to the injected script. And then that means if we want to change something that's actually on the target page, if you click, um, when we click our show hidden fields button, that's gonna send something to the service worker, which is gonna send something to a different iframe, which is gonna send it back to the injected script, which is then gonna modify the page. 
This is just to show you that even though it looks kind of simple on top, there's actually a lot behind the scenes that we're doing to try to make this as uh, seamless as possible. And then of course we use Zap as a server now using the API. So we can do a lot of the um, intense functionality that's already built into Zap. And we leverage WebSockets so we can get live streaming events. So as you're visiting pages and it's, uh, your uh, history is building up or it detects an alert, uh, we can get those sent over. It gets to an event bus in Zap and that's gonna get streamed right to the service worker uh, so we can display it in real time. And finally, all of these things communicate with IndexedDB because that's where we store our state. And, uh, and so we can kind of send things from server for IndexedDB and then pull them up so that it's all cached and ready to go. So you can see, I intentionally made this look pretty ugly because it's just like a lot going on in there to build this kind of uh, a setup. So great, it looks really cool, right? Like when can you play with it? So we've been working on it for a while and we're hoping to uh, have it ready for people to play with um, sometime in November. Uh, we've got it to a state where it's ready to demo, but there's still some reliability issues, um, some things to make it more robust, make sure we're good across at least Chrome and Firefox. Um, there's weird technical edge cases that come up in this. So one thing is it's actually hard to use the HUD across multiple tabs at the same time, just with the way we're gonna store state. And it's fun working on this project because service workers have been around for a while, but they're still not commonly used. Um, so we've actually run into a bug recently with the way that Firefox isolates its processes. So the spec is, says that it's supposed to be one service worker process running for all your domains and all of your tabs. But now we have this isolation per tab. And so it means it's actually multiple instances running of the service worker in Firefox, but in Chrome, there's only one process. And so it's like, oh, okay. Uh, we've kind of like hacked our way into like one of these paradigms. So there's little weird things like that, um, which is kind of cool to work on a project like this when the problem is that there's a bug in Firefox. Uh, it's kind of exciting. So we're hoping to work these things out and get it out to people um, because we want people to start hacking on it. We want people to start developing on it um, and start using it to get feedback uh, so we can start iterating on it. Uh, so please, come help. Uh, the bar is really, really low. If you can write any sort of JavaScript, please help us out. Uh, I learned JavaScript building this project. Um, the team, the Zap core team, by the way, is like four people. So I found that super impressive when I joined. I was like, this is a really awesome product, and I know a lot of products that have a lot more people. Um, yeah, I was really impressed uh, by that. Um, so yeah, it's just like two or three of us uh, right now. We're hoping to ramp up in the next couple of months to really be able to take on a lot of uh, contributions at once. Right now, um, you have to be a little patient with us as we're trying to work some of these things out. Um, but please, please come tell us if you're interested in this. If you just have an idea for a tool and you just want to build a new tool, we'll hook you up. We'll tell you how to get started. You can work on your own time and just submit to us when you've built something awesome. Uh, and I just want to thank uh, all these different people. Um, segment where I work at, they really supported me working on this project. Uh, the Zap Core team was awesome, uh, welcoming in to start working with them. Uh, Simon Bennett is incredible if anyone's worked with him. Um, we both kind of had this idea independently. So I reached out to Zap. I was like, hey, I kind of want to work on this thing where you can modify the page to show some stuff. He's like, well, look at this little POC I've got. And I was like, oh, cool. Um, so he's been very awesome bringing me in, helping me work on this project. And then OWASP, of course, for all of this and having me. Um, it's been pretty awesome. Thanks, everybody.